Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. And tonight we are going to be getting into the Word of God in Romans chapter 6. But before we do that, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this night. We thank you and praise you for the opportunity to dig into your Word together. Lord, help us to um, just know and learn more about you through your Word. God, I just praise you for all your answers to prayer today, how you've been healing and watching over those that are that have been sick. And Lord, I, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your love, your kindness towards us, Lord. You're so good. Your grace is amazing, Lord, and we thank you. God, I just ask again that you would bless your word tonight. Bless those that are here. Uh, bless those that are watching by, you know, on the internet at home. And we just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, so tonight we're going to be taking a look at Romans chapter 6, and um, we're going to be looking at our personal war against sin and that's one of the things that uh that i think that each one of us has a personal responsibility to contend with the flesh the old nature and and crucify that thing each and every day so let's go to romans chapter six and starting at verse one it says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you are servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness." What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank God that he shows us here in Romans chapter 6 this battle, this you know constant battle that we have against that old nature and against sin. We have a personal responsibility as Christians to fight against sin in our own self, not to go fight against your neighbor's sin, okay, or, or the person down the street or, you know, their sin. Now you give them the gospel message so they can be free from sin, but you have a personal responsibility to fight against sin that would come against your own life in yourself. And it, and it originates, where does sin come from? From your own lust, the Bible tells us. That's where it comes from. And so... You have to wage war against these things. You have to crucify that old man and understand that that our old nature, our you know, we were we died with Christ and we were raised. This is why it says here, "For he that's dead is freed from sin." If we died with Christ, then why are we living in sin? We should not live in sin any longer. I should have muted our things on here. So, praise the Lord. Anyway, 
And going back up, you know, there's today, if, you know, verses 1, 2, and 3 are very important. Why sh what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many as us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You know, one of the things that's important today to realize is that there's not um, there's not a, a lot of preaching about personal responsibility to stand against sin in our own lives. There's not a lot of talk about that today. People, you know, say, well, I'm under grace, so I'm, I'm good to go. I don't need to I don't need to be concerned about that. Or if I if I go out and, and do this, I'm under grace, so I'm still covered. I'm good to go. That is not the way that a Christian should be living our lives. We shouldn't be living our lives in a way that says, oh, I can go violate God's word and live against God the whole week. And then, you know, then expect all of his blessings. That doesn't work like that. And we've been talking about that from Jeremiah, using the examples in Jeremiah, that it does not work like that. Amen? Okay, praise the Lord. Is there any way to put the sound system on? Thank you so much. Uh, um, that way we can get the speaker going and you can hear better. So, praise the Lord. Um, it says here in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, uh, says this. It says, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, this is talking about how we're looking to Christ, right? We, we're crucified with him. We identify with him in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. We, you know, the resurrection to us as Christians, it's looking forward to that day when our body is is made brand new right this body that's breaking down that's that's getting uh it's it's not doing so good the older we get we find we have more problems somebody said your check engine light comes on at a certain age and and i kind of believe that you know it's you know that seems to happen so um you know there there is there is some truth to to the fact that this body is breaking down but thanks be to god that we have this promise here that I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're living this life now in because of Christ, because of his love for us, what he did for us. This is why we have life today. Without Jesus, we don't have life. We have nothing. We have, you know, all, all we have is what... Without Jesus, we have what the world has, and that is nothing but but fear of what's coming next. And we don't have that as Christians. We have faith. We know that God has got this. We know that the world right now is in turmoil with things that are going on. They're, they're being fearful about, about uh, events, but we can look forward in faith and say, you know what? However it works out, God's got it. Because everything will transpire, everything will go according to his plan, according to his word. So we have no fear in that. We have no fear of things to come because we know that God has got it. You know, we're, our trust is in Jesus Christ. We're looking towards, for him, you know, in his return. And uh, we thank God for that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 5. Six or through twenty three. So Colossians chapter two verses six through twenty three. We're going to read a little bit at a time, but it says here, "As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving." So here's our responsibility as a Christian: we're to walk in Christ. What does it mean to walk in Christ? It means that we're to be rooted, built up in Him, established in the faith as you uh, in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So you have the Word of God. You know what His will is, what God's will is for your life. 
you know, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The Bible tells us we're to live our lives in a way that pleases God. That means that we're not out to please ourselves. We're not out living for our own, you know, our own things, but we're living for the Lord. What God's will is for us. Now, you don't have to wander around in a in a daze wondering what's God's will for me. What's God's will for you? He spells it out right here in his word. He tells you what his will is for you. You don't have it's not a mystery. It's it's revealed right here. We're to become, you know, as Christians, we're to become followers of Jesus Christ. We're to we're to live our lives in obedience to Christ and to his word, not doing our own will, but doing the will that, you know, of the Lord. We're to do what he called us to do. What did he say? Going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our assignment. That's what we've been given. We're also told to love one another. That's an assignment. That's what we've been given. And those things, we are. our faithfulness is going to be judged. Are, are we faithful to what God has called us to do? You know, when did the church get a pass from God to not obey his word? Did COVID give the church a pass to not do the will of God? No. Did we still do the will of God even though COVID was here? Yes, because you find a way. Just like the early church when they were being persecuted, they didn't, you know, the early church when they were being persecuted, they didn't say, you know what, it's okay, they're, they're killing us, we're, gonna just, we're still going to meet at the synagogue. We're all going to be there because God's going to protect us. Did they do that? No. no. Where did they meet? In the catacombs, right? They got down in the catacombs. They went where they had to go to still continue to serve God, to still bring the message of the gospel to, to people, and, and they found a way. Just like today, God provided a way for us to communicate the gospel, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another. Even if you're not physically here in this room with me, you can be with me right here online. You can tune in online and still get encouraged, still be strengthened, still communicate because you can post right here as the message is going on. You can post questions. You can post, you know, you can... See, you can have that interaction. Now, it's not just limited to that because we, we talked to one another. We called one another. We, we were there. You know, God gave you opportunity to witness to your friends, your neighbors, your, you know, the people that lived around you. I pray that people took advantage of those things during, during COVID where they got to know the neighbors that lived around them better. I can tell you that I know all those neighbors that live around me. And, you know, one of the things that's great is giving the gospel message to people that don't know Jesus Christ. You can do that. Amen. And that's what you're supposed to do. You know, it's it's a sad thing that if you're a Christian and you don't know who lives next door to you. Amen. You're a Christian. You don't know anybody that lives around you. Well, should it be that way? You know, we have a we have a, an apartment building that's actually right next to us. And it's a wonderful opportunity because people move in and move out and and stuff, and you know, we we met a lot of people there, and and we uh, continue to meet people there, and and uh, we don't hide away from from people. We get out there and talk to them, you know, let them know that we love them, let them know that God loves them. You know, there's a, you can demonstrate your Christianity out there, Amen. Rather than just saying, "Well, I love the Lord," you know, well, okay, great, demonstrate that. You know, ha. <laughs> There's nothing more loving than giving the gospel message to somebody that doesn't know Jesus. There's nothing more loving than that. Why do missionaries, why do missionaries go into the furthest reaches of the world? Why do they go into those dangerous territories? Why do they do that? Because they love God. They love him and they want to communicate God's love to a lost and dying world. You know, this is an amazing thing. I talked to a missionary uh, this week. Um, he called. He called up, and he's up north. And him and his and his wife, uh, uh, they're um, they're called by God. They feel the call of God to go to Eastern Germany. And uh, Eastern Germany is a wonderful place that needs the gospel message for sure. They they lived under the the reign of communism for years, and uh, and uh, thank God that when the wall came down, there was a reunification there. But there is a desperate need for the gospel there. And as you know, there's a lot of tensions going on in that area of the world right now. And yet this uh, this brother in the Lord is 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 firmly his face is firmly fixed to go to um, eastern Germany and bring the gospel message to them. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I actually going to ask this brother to come down here at some point here in the near future to the church and 
and actually uh, talk about what he's going to go do and what God has laid on his heart to do for, um, you know, for that mission. So uh, he's uh, here in uh, in the same uh, same region right now. It's right up north, north of us. So praise the Lord. Okay. Praise God. Get back to it. It says here, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And this is what's been happening to the church today. People have bought off on uh, a lot of crazy conspiracy theories and, and just things that are just so outlandish that years ago it wouldn't have happened. But today, because of fear, because of, of things that are going on, they, they get... Um, I don't know, they open the door. Once you open the door to the enemy, you know, he comes right in. He'll come right in. And so um, it was just interesting to me that the church had uh, went through a lot of things. We noticed that when COVID first happened, that there were people um, out there floundering because they were listening to the news and they were listening to, um, you know, uh, extreme views on all sides. They were listening to one group in particular that uh, it turned out to be, um, it was kind of funny because as we talked about it before, I said this is probably a guy that's down in his mom's basement sending out messages, and it turns out that wasn't too far off the mark. The guy it was, a, it was a guy who was sending messages to himself, and then he posed them as if they were coming from a, you know some special source, and he was just you know off his rocker. And, and the sad thing is, is there's Christians out there that bought right into it and fell headlong into this thing. And uh, it's a sad, it was a sad case. But that's what happens when you get away from the Bible and you start paying attention to these uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, you should know that once you step a foot away from the Bible, Satan will keep you out there. He doesn't want you putting your, your faith and trust in Jesus. He doesn't want you grounded and rooted and grounded in the word of God, putting on Jesus Christ. He doesn't want that at all. He wants you to be out there acting crazy and doing stuff that brings discredit upon Christ. That's what Satan wants you to do. But we're not going to do what he wants us to do. Amen? We're going to do what God wants us to do. It says, uh, it says here, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith and operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat and drink in respect of a holy day or new moon or Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body uh, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship in humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. But if ye be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man 
which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Jew, Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which ye are also are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You know, that is, that is what we're supposed to do. That is, the, that is the map, the road map of you want to defeat personal sin in your life. Realize that you're not your own. You were bought with a price. You're crucified with Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. You, you're, you're to put on all of these things, you know, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. You know, you're supposed to let the peace of God rule in your heart. You're, you're supposed to do uh, put on charity. Charity is love, that love, that agape love of God. All of these things that we're supposed to be doing rather than engaging in sin in our lives. You don't have time for that. You don't have time for what Satan is trying to throw your way. We don't, we don't need that. What we need to do is get back to the scripture and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to put this on. I'm going, to put, I'm going to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. How do I let the word of Christ dwell in me richly? Well, I've got to get into the word of Christ. I've got to read it. It's right here in your Bible. It's not, it's not somewhere off waiting for some revelation you know, from some guy that's throwing something at you. No, it is from the word of God. This is, this, is, this is the Word of God revealed to us. This is His Word given to us. This is all we need. You know, we have, there's people out there today saying, oh, I've got, I got this Word of the Lord, you know, Word from the Lord, that, and, and there, as if it supersedes what you've got in your hands. I'm going to tell you what, nothing supersedes the Word of God. Nothing, nothing. This Word will stand forever. This Word will stand as eternity goes. The Word of God continues. It endures forever. It never ends. So don't let somebody beguile you, trick you, you know, uh, into into doing things like you say, following angels and and uh, you know, intruding into the things they haven't seen, vainly puffed up. This is what happens today when people get their eyes off of Christ. They start looking at all these other things and think of these hidden mysteries. And, and I, listen, God puts His word out there plainly. You don't need to use numerology. Hello, you don't need to use numerology. To try to figure out some secret coding in, in, you know, through the scripture. No. Let me just tell you just plainly. God puts his word out plainly for all to see. It is, it is clear and it is perfect and it doesn't need to be messed with. You know, you can go in and, and manipulate and, and try to come up with some, some crazy stuff. You should not be sucked into that. Don't, don't, don't go there. As a Christian, follow Jesus. You got his word plainly laid out before you. Don't get pulled into all kinds of crazy conspiracy and uh, theories and, and, and weird weirdness that's out there because there's so much of it. You know, there's there's no place in the life of a Christian to get to get hauled into that kind of stuff. If you're spending time in his word and you're spend that's where you're you know, you spend the majority of your time in his word, listening to his word, reading his word, talking about his word, thinking about his word. You're not going to have time for crazy conspiracies. As a matter of fact, when those things pop up, you're going to right away see, whoa, that is not of God. That has nothing to do with God right there. As a matter of fact, I know who that's from. That's the devil doing that. You know, you have people who, um, who got so pulled into all of this stuff, they, they left common sense behind. Just jettisoned common sense and went for just craziness. You know, to I... I I hate to say it today, but we got a generation of Christians today that if Satan pulled you up to the top of that temple and said, jump off, they'd do it. Because they're not realizing how that's tempting the Lord. 
It's a sad thing. Pay attention to the scripture. You know, the children of Israel, when they were in the promise, not in the promised land, when they were still in Egypt, waiting to, to be let out, that night that the angel came in and, and killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, you know, Israel was inside their homes with the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the house as the, as the angel passed over them because it saw the blood on the doorposts of the, of the home. This is a symbol definitely of, of our redemption in Christ, how He paid the price for us. We're redeemed in Him. Do you know, the Scripture is pretty plain about it. If they had won out of that house, they'd have died if they were firstborn. They'd have died. You know, they could have said, well, you know, we're the, we're the chosen people. God selected, you know, Jacob and, and Isaac and, and Abraham and, and we're his descendants. And you know what? We can step out of this house and we're, and we're good to go because we're the chosen people. And if they'd have done that and they'd been the firstborn, they'd have died right on the spot. Because you can't violate God's word and think it's okay with God. You can't step outside of what he wants you to step outside of and think you're going to be okay because you won't be. That's called presumption. And sadly, we have Christians today that have done exactly that. Exactly that. And good, good Christians that love Jesus, that put themselves in a bad spot because of presumption. Because you've got preachers out there not preaching to stick to the word. They started preaching politics from the pulpit. You don't need politics from the pulpit. Need the word of God being preached from the pulpit. And I've seen a lot of brothers in Christ that the good, I love them. I thank God for them. I know they love Jesus and, and I know they meant right, but they're preaching politics from the pulpit. Just preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, all long suffering and doctrine. Never once said preach politics. When we look at Jesus' life in, in his ministry, um, in the Gospels, you never once see Jesus preaching politics. Even though politicians confronted him, the Herodians, you don't see Jesus responding with politics. The closest statement you could get to that is render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And if only we would do that in our personal lives. You know, there, there is standing for the Lord and we should do that. But we're standing for the Lord, not for a political party, not for a political agenda, not even for a nation, even though God has placed us in nations and thank God for the nations that he has placed each one of us in. We have a job to do in that nation, wherever we are. But remember, that is not your home. Heaven is your home. We have a country that, that is not of this world. We belong to the heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. And yes, we reside here. We live here. But we are ambassadors for Christ. We live, we are, we live for the Lord. He is our life. He is our Savior. He is our King. And this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. He will reign here forever. He's going to rule this world. And all the nations will come to Him. But today we have people that have gotten caught up in current events, got to where they got into hatred, got into acting unchristian like yet still we're floating the name of Jesus. Like you can't, you, can't, you can't cuss out a politician and then the next words out of your mouth, well, you know, keep us in prayer. We're fighting the good fight. What? Exactly how, did, how does that work? 
Maybe the idea is to go back and crucify your own flesh. Get yourself back in agreement with God's word. Put on Jesus Christ. What does it say right there? What does it say? Above all these things in verse 14, chapter Colossians 3, 14. And above all these things, put on charity. It's love. Which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also you are called in one body. And be thankful. Love, peace, and thankfulness. That's what's supposed to be coming out of our lives. Not anger, hatred, cursing, bitterness. That's not supposed to be coming out of our lives. And yet that's what you, you've you seen. If you haven't seen it, thank the Lord you haven't seen it. I've seen it plenty. Especially through COVID. I've experienced that from, from Christians during COVID. Actually, during COVID, I would say that it wasn't the world that was actually being nasty and mean. It was Christians being nasty and mean. I experienced more grief and more, more pain from Christians through COVID than I ever did from anybody out here in the world. And I, I can tell you, I've been around the world. But it's Christians that were acting unchristlike. And yet, pray for me. Well, I'll pray for you, for sure. But that God would open your eyes that you might see. Sad thing. Sad things. You know, if we don't learn our lessons, if we don't turn from our sin when God chastises us, there is more that He can do. Did you know that? God is long-suffering. He's very long-suffering. But is there an end to His patience with us? Is there, is there a time where His patience comes to an end there? Well, I think that scripturally you can back that up and say amen and amen. There's a time when He says, you know, let Him alone. You know, it was a sad thing reading that scripture, you know, about Ephraim, you know, having his idols, and He says, let him alone. It's, I, I can tell you, you wouldn't want that. So it's, it's really for us, thank, thanks be to God that Jesus is with us. He loves us. He doesn't give up on us. He, he'll keep on working with you and, and he keeps on after you. But don't think that, that his um, patience with you is permission. Patience and long-suffering is not permission for us to continue in sin. We're to put sin to death in our lives, crucify it. We're not to continue in sin. We're to fight against it. You know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those strongholds are sometimes are built in our very own lives. If you let sin go and you don't address it it'll build that stronghold in your life you'll harden your heart do you ever wonder how a person gets to a place where they don't they're not repentant anymore it's because they have hardened their heart they've calloused themselves against sin and as much as god is dealing with you it you start not repenting you start not turning to him it's not a good place to be. Then you have deaf ears. Wonder how the Pharisees and the Sadducees, wonder how they got to the point when their own very own Messiah showed up on the scene exactly at the timing that Scripture said that he would come. Ever wonder why they didn't recognize that? When he was doing miracles that no one else had ever done before, that no one else could do. You ever wonder how they could just like not perceive that this is him? You ever wonder about that after he told them multiple times who he was? And not just in word, but in power, in demonstration. You ever wonder how they got themselves in that place? See, that's what religion will do to you. When your heart is not tender towards God, when your heart is, is, is just hardened and, and all you have is an outward form of religion, that's what happens. You miss it. 
And that's what's happened in, in our country, at least, is we have an outward form of religion in this nation. But where's the heart? Where's the love? Where's the compassion? You know, there's people living out on these streets. In this town, there's people living under these bridges. There's ones that got flooded. And up and down this, this highway, I went up and down this I-5, and if you go into Oregon, you see, you see hundreds and hundreds of people living in tents along the sides of the roads. And yet, this is one of the richest nations in the world. How do we get there? How do we walk by and drive by people that are destitute as we head to our homes that are well warmed and eat a good meal and there's people suffering, going without, literally dying in the cold and the elements? How, how do we do that? The poor we'll always have with us. The Lord said that. But it's not that we're supposed to neglect the poor that will always with us. We need to do something about helping people. And if everybody could help somebody, at least we'd do something. And so, yeah, there's, a, you know, yeah, of course, I know that there's a lot of people out there, you know, doing scams and stuff like that. I know that. But it doesn't take too much too much imagination to figure out when you see people living out there like that that they're they're in a real bad situation you ever wonder why the lord said you know he who has two coats you know give to the one that has none you know you ever wonder about that beatitudes you ever think about beatitudes you know about that's christian conduct you know matthew chapter five right that's christian conduct as christians this is how we're supposed to to live Christians are supposed to be known by, by our love. We are supposed to give the gospel message first and foremost. It's the gospel message. The church got it messed up when they said, well, we're going to do good deeds and we're not going to give the gospel. Well, that's you didn't accomplish anything. You know, that alpha course where they bring people in, they feed them food, and then they, they say, well, what do you think about God? And the people say whatever they say, and they don't contradict a single thing. They just say, oh, okay, that's great. We're going to build friendships and relationships and not tell them the truth. Well, that's unfair, and, and actually it's unloving. You know, that's not what they did in the missions before. These big missions that, that were working in the inner cities, do you know when they went in there and they hey, put, put, put those great big signs out front that says Jesus saves? They weren't hiding the message. And they bring people in and they give them food to eat and a place to stay. And guess what they'd give them in that mission? The gospel. And you know what happened in those missions? People came to Jesus. People got born again. People changed their lives. They still were dealing with the same kind of issues that we have today today. You know, alcohol and drug abuse and all the things that we're dealing with today, they dealt with then, but they, they gave the gospel message. Whereas today, people just want to entertain them and not contradict their, the, the thoughts that they have about God, which are completely not right. And so you allow somebody to be fed, maybe even warmed, but in the end, you've changed nothing and they end up in hell. And you had the answer, and we were too cowardly to give it because you didn't want to offend somebody. That says kind of what that is. We need to be bold with the truth. But boldness with the truth is not being unloving with the truth. Boldness doesn't mean you're going and yelling and beating people up with the Scripture. Boldness means that you boldly proclaim the name of Jesus as the only way. He is the only way. There isn't multiple ways. There's one way, and that's Jesus Christ. That's it. And as a Christian, it's not because of our good things and, and how wonderful we are that God saved, it is, saved us. It's because of his grace and his mercy. And so when you communicate that message to somebody who's in a position of not knowing Jesus and let them know, hey, you know, we're the same. The difference is that I have turned my life over to Christ. I know that he is the only way. He paid the price for my sin and he can do it for you. He can change your life. He can give you a brand new life. You know, you people today want a do-over, right? 
They want to do over on their lives. They, they want a reset button on their life. Guess what? God can do that to you. He can wash away and wipe away the sin of your life. He can give you a brand new life in Him. But you've got to give the truth to people. If you don't give the gospel message, they'll never hear it. So you address the spiritual needs first. You address the physical needs as well. Amen. Otherwise, it's only a social program. You are right. Another one. And actually, it's probably not as good as what the, the government does since they, they got a lot of more money from our taxes and stuff. Yeah, the point is keeping people out of hell. You're right. I mean, our love for the lost. Think about it. You were there. That was you. You were there. You were lost. You were on your way to hell. You didn't even know it. You were you were headed down that road and someone, someone through obedience to God and love for the Savior, someone told you about the gospel. Somebody gave you the good news. Because the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody gave you the word. You heard it. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and he changed your life. And he didn't change your life just for that good news to stop with you. He wants you to continue to spread that good news to others. Churches that once were full are not full now for one good reason. The church decided to entertain people rather than to give them the gospel that they might be saved. So, wow. We need to get back to the basics. That means get back to here, the word of God. Get back to the mission that we've been called to do is reach the lost with the good news of the gospel. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them that he came, he died, he rose again, and he's coming back again. Tell them. Because if you don't tell them, and I don't tell them, who's going to? You think they're going to get the message from Hollywood correctly? Never going to happen. Satan is all over Hollywood. Anyway, Isaiah chapter 53. Let's read that together. Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence Neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, 
because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus did this for all of us. Not just for those here in this room, not for those on the internet here, but for every human being on this planet, Jesus Christ died. He paid the price for our sins, our transgression against God. He paid it. All we have to do is turn to him and trust him as Savior and Lord and live for him. Amen? Live for him. Well, um, that's it for night, tonight, Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your, your word tonight, Lord. Help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to be obedient to getting the gospel message. We see here in Isaiah 53 what Jesus endured for us, what he went through for us. Lord, we so appreciate what you've done. God, the grace that you gave us, you didn't have to. The love that you've shown us, you didn't have to give it. But you did in sending your son, Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, to save us from certain destruction, to give us life everlasting with you and your presence. Lord, our lives are not about us, and our lives certainly are not about the things of this world, but they're about you, Lord, to bring glory and honor and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, help us in our lives today to humble ourselves to not seek our own ways, but to seek yours all the days of our lives. Let us be faithful to the charge to preach the gospel to every creature. Help us to be faithful to the charge to love one another. Help us to be faithful to your word all the days of our lives. We just pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. May God bless you.